Hello, and welcome to this video on conservative forces. In this video, we're going to quickly introduce what conservative forces are, providing a working definition. And then we're going to think about this uh, special feature of conservative forces, which is that there's an associated potential energy. And once you realize that, you're confronted with this question of, should you treat them as work, um, as forces which do work, or should you treat them in the context of being a potential energy in the system. So first, let's see what they are. And basically to think about this, suppose you've got two points, say A and B, and you want to maybe push a box between them, or you want to do something, you're going to apply a force, and there's basically some initial position and some final result um, of this motion and the forces that you're applying. And if that force does a work which doesn't care if you sort of go this way or if you go all round and about in whatever crazy path you like and then you end up at the same final point, then that force is what we call a conservative force. So conservative forces are these ones where the work done is path independent. It's just a force where it doesn't matter what path you followed, all you care about is the initial and the final state of that system. And if this is true, if you've got a conservative force, then it turns out that what we're really kind of doing is it's kind of storing that work. Because since it's path independent, you can also say that clearly, if I reverse that, then I can get that work back out. And so that leads us to conclude that there's an associated potential energy. So let's take a look at an example of such a case and see, indeed, if it is conservative and we'll use this criteria of being path independent to check. So let's suppose that I'm, my end state is that I've got a spring and I want to compress it by three centimeters. And I'm actually starting from a state where the length of the spring is just its normal equilibrium length. But the way in which I'm going to compress by three centimeters is I'm going to do two different methods. So method A, I'm going to go ahead and take this spring and I'm going to stretch it first by five centimeters. Then, keeping it taut, so still applying the force required to basically keep the end moving steadily, not letting it accelerate, I'm going to allow that thing to move back to its normal length. Once it's at its normal length, I'm then going to start actually pushing, and I'm going to then finally compress this thing by three centimeters. And then the other method that we'll employ is going to be the obvious and direct approach, which is I'm starting at the normal length, and I'll just compress it by three centimeters. So the first step of method B is exactly the same as the last step of method A, but method A has this extra business of stretching and then allowing to return to normal length um, this spring. So the question is, does that extra step change the work that I have to do to compress the spring? So let's think about this. We know that we've got a spring, we'll pretend or assume that it's hooking in. So we know that the force that the spring is exerting is just negative kx. And so the force that I have to apply in order to do whatever I'm doing is just going to be f is equal to kx. And remember, x is my displacement, the amount by which I'm stretching or compressing this thing relative to its normal length. So if I'm stretching this thing by 5 centimeters, I have to integrate because I've got a varying force. So I'm going to integrate from 0 to 5 of just this force that I have to apply and dot it into dx. I'm applying the force in the direction of the displacement. So indeed, um, the dot product just gives me a 1, and I can drop the dot. So then when I evaluate this, I just get that it's supposed to be 1 half of kx squared from 0 to 5 which just gives me 25 on 2 times that spring constant, whatever it has to be. So that's the work done in step 1. Okay, what about step 2? Well, in step 2, the displacement is now back in the other direction, but the force is still in the same direction. I'm working against the force of the spring here still because the spring wants to accelerate the end back, but I'm holding it so that it stays taut, so that it does not accelerate. I'm just gradually letting it move back. 
So in this case, when I take the dot product of my force dotted into the tiny bit of displacement, I do in fact get a negative sign overall. So I've got a negative kx dx. And of course, that's the same integral, but with a negative sign out in front. So I'm going to get a negative 25 on 2 times k for this step. So I realize that parts 1 and 2 cancel off with each other. So the work done after I've gotten back and finished step 2 is actually 0 at this point. And then I'm left with the step of compressing it by 3 centimeters. And that's exactly the same thing I do in step B. Which means that, in fact, this method is irrelevant. It did not care that I first stretched the spring by any actual amount. It doesn't matter that I chose 5, in fact. You can see that I could have easily put 6 here and 6 there. It's always the same but negative integral. And that is telling me that, indeed, this path independence exists for the spring's restoring force. It doesn't matter how I've gone about doing it. Overall, the work that I've done is exactly the same. So, the spring force, the restoring force of a spring, is indeed a conservative force. We now have a question that we have to answer, which is the fact that we've now seen that the spring force is basically a conservative force, and it has a potential energy. So the question now is, if we're thinking about what happens to the energy of a system, should we consider that spring as doing, as exerting a spring force, which does work, or should we consider it as storing potential energy? And basically, it doesn't matter which one you decide, but you must make sure that you don't do both. If you consider it as a force doing work, and then, secondly, include the effects of its potential energy, well, then you've basically counted that spring twice, so you're just double counting. So you need to pick one or the other. And you also have to be aware that, actually, it's not always up to you. Sometimes, your choice of the system forces you to choose whether or not you're going to treat other forces as doing work or as giving rise to potential energy. For example, if you've defined your system as everything but the spring, then the spring is something external to your system, and it's only interacting with your system through that restoring force. So it's a force that does work. On the other hand, if the spring is part of your system, then you're free to go ahead and say, well, I don't really want to treat it as work done by the force of the spring. I'd rather, in fact, treat it as the potential energy being stored in and taken out of the spring. Okay, so basically the criteria is, though, that if you're going to, whatever storing the potential energy, if it's energy stored in an interaction, then both interacting objects have to be part of the system. If it's talking about just the energy of configuration of an object, then that, that object must be in the system. So that's how we're being forced to choose. OK, so in summary, we've seen that a conservative force is just one that has work which um, is independent of the path you've used and only depends on that initial and final state of the system. And if you've got such a force, there's an associated potential energy and then that leads you to have to think carefully about, are you going to treat it as work? Or are you going to treat it as potential energy? And usually that's fine. You can make either choice as long as you don't double count the effect of that force. OK, hope that's been helpful in order to kind of think about whether it was just one question. So we gave you a bunch of forces in the forces video. Go back to that force toolkit and think about which ones of those are actually conservative forces.